Hey there, Joshua here. Have you ever wondered how telephone systems, digital audio recordings, CD laser discs if still present, voicemail, and all that good stuff work? They are the primary building blocks of advanced communication systems and yet we know little about them and what's the theory behind? Well, you're in luck because in this video we will be exploring pulse code modulation or also known as PCM. PCM is the commonly used digital modulation scheme. In PCM, the available range of signal voltages is divided into levels and each is assigned a binary number. Each sample is then represented by the binary number representing the level closest to its amplitude. And this number is transmitted in serial form in our digital network and converted back to our original analog signal. Ha! <laughs> Basic, right? Well, I know it sounds complicated at first, but let us explain it even further. Basically, in PCM, we take an analog signal, say a telephone call, and convert it into a digital signal. How do we do that? PCM consists of three steps. Sampling, quantizing, and encoding. Let's look at the first step. Sampling. Sampling is defined as the process of measuring the instantaneous values of continuous time signal in the discrete form. Samples are amplitudes taken from an analog signal over a constant time interval. Let's say a signal on the time domain is sampled 30 times per second. We take the instantaneous value of that signal over a constant time interval 30 times. We are just converting the continuous signal to discrete signal, and the number of vertical lines depends on the sampling rate. The number of samples per second is called the sampling rate. In signal processing, the Nyquist frequency, named after Harry Nyquist, is a characteristic of a sampler which converts a continuous function or signal into a discrete sequence. The sampling theorem essentially says that a signal has to be sampled at least with twice the highest frequency of the original signal, or better, two and a half times. The higher the sampling rate, the closer you are to the original signal. To avoid aliasing, we have to put a low-pass filter to filter out high frequencies that are not within the Nyquist frequency. Without a low-pass filter, aliasing would occur, hence a distortion of the signal. Once we are done with sampling, let's look at the second step, quantization. Quantization is a process of rounding off the discrete time signal to the nearest level. How do we determine the levels? Well. That is easy. To determine the levels on the quantization stage, we first determine what is our bit depth. Bit depth is essentially the number of bits per sample. It can be 4 bits, 8 bits, or 16 bits per sample, or whatever you like. But it's important to keep in mind that the higher the bit, the higher the resolution, the higher the number of levels, hence the wider the bandwidth which is a major disadvantage because wide bandwidth consumes more frequency space. Going back to quantization, the number of levels available depends on the number of bits used to express the sample value. The number of levels is given by n equals to 2 raised to m, where n is a number of levels, while m is a bit depth. So for a bit depth of 4, we get 16 levels. For a bit depth of 8, we get 256 levels, and so on and so forth. Once the levels are determined, the sample values will be rounded off to the nearest available level. Think of it as magnets attracted to the nearest piece of metal. The samples will snap or latch to the nearest levels. I hope you understand that. <laughs> Since the original signal can have an infinite number of levels, the process of quantization produces errors called quantizing error or quantizing noise. Quantizing errors are basically the difference between the original signal and the quantized signal. To reduce these errors, we must increase the number of levels which was mentioned earlier consumes more bandwidth. Quantization falls into two categories, uniform quantization and non-uniform quantization. Uniform quantization is a type of quantization wherein the levels are uniformly spaced. Having uniform quantization may produce large errors for low-level signals and very minimal errors to the high-level signals. 
For example, consider a quantization error of 0.05 volts happening in a high-level signal of 5 volts. The signal-to-noise ratio will just be 1%. But for lower signals like 0.5 volts low-level signal, with quantizing error of 0.05 volts will produce a signal-to-noise ratio of 10%. That is why uniform quantization is good for high signals and bad for low signals. For this problem to be solved, we introduce non-uniform quantization. In non-uniform quantization, the steps are not equal in size. Small steps are used for small signal values and large steps for large values. The purpose of doing so is to make the signal-to-noise ratio nearly independent of the signal level. In every level of the sampled and quantized signal, there is an equivalent binary code. For example, a quantized signal having 16 levels will have binary codes of 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 from the negative peak of the signal to 1, 0, 0, 0, 0 binary code at the positive peak of the signal. This shows that the number of levels is just converted to binary codes. With all of those things said and done, it's time for a recap. So we finished sampling, we have already taken samples of the original signal, and we're also done with quantization. The rounding off of the discrete values of the signal closest to its amplitude, it's time for encoding. Encoding is a process of converting each sample to specific binary numbers. Let's look at this signal for our example. You can notice that the binary codes above the x-axis starts with 1, and all that is below the x-axis is 0. This simply tells the receiver if the sample is a positive or negative voltage. The next three bit represents the segment or levels. There are 8 levels above and 8 levels below. The last 4 digits shown as x, 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 x indicates where in particular level that the voltage light is located. These binary codes are then transmitted through a carrier in serial form. The transmission bandwidth varies directly with the bitrate. In order to keep the bitrate and thus the required bandwidth low, compounding is often used. Compounding involves using a compressor amplifier at the input stage, with greater gain for low-level signals than for high-level signal. The compressor reduces the quantizing errors for small signals. The effects of compression can be reversed by using a method called expansion at the receiver, with a gain characteristics that is the inverse of that at the transmitter. Now let's head on to the whiteboard to visualize things. Compounding is a mixture of two words, compression and expansion. Now let's go with the compressor characteristics. In compressor characteristics, Let's say we have a linear signal. All of the low level signals are greatly amplified, while the higher signals will be attenuated. Now let's move on to the characteristics of the expander. Let's say again we have a signal here that is linear. All of the low-level signals will be greatly attenuated, while the higher signals will be amplified. Well, I guess that's it for passcode modulation. We may fail to explain everything in great detail, but at least the basics were discussed. If you still think that we missed something, comment it down below and share this to your friends, your family, your um, engineering friends, computer engineers, electronics engineers, communications engineers, and all that good friends of yours or families of yours. <laughs> Thank you and see you next time.